good morning and welcome back friends uh, on these uh, sessions of uh, neuroanatomy uh, we have had two sessions uh, so far uh, discussing about the embryology and the gross uh, structural organization of the nervous system so uh, on these weekends now from henceforth we will be now uh, starting with uh, fundamental anatomical concepts uh, in various parts of the nervous system. So today we are going to discuss the supratentorial compartment uh, uh, in, 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 in brief. So uh, just before we commence, uh, if, if there are any, any hiccups during, uh, during the session, uh, I will not be able to pick up the chats that go on because my screen only projects uh, the presentation. So if you have got any queries, if there are any hiccups, please put it on the chat group and Tanvir will pick it up and and, and ring me. OK, so the supratentorial compartment. So uh, what do we mean by the supratentorial compartment? What is this tent that is being referred to? So the tent is the tentorium cerebelli, which is basically the tent under which the cerebellum resides. And, and, and like any tent, it has got the fixed margins over here or the attached margins against the petrous bone and there are the free margins uh, of the of the tentorium uh, and the structure above it is of course the supratentorial which is the topic of discussion today and tomorrow we will be uh, looking at the infratentorial compartment uh, so so that's the tent that has been referred to and as you can see this tent has got a hole a gaping hole in the middle which is the tentorial hiatus and the tentorial hiatus is for transmission of the brainstem structures that you can see over here uh, the details of the tent the tentorium and the venous plexus we will discuss uh, during our discussions on on the on the venous anatomy itself uh, and you can see how precarious this uh, this this hole is uh, uh, and you can see over here you can see the brain stem the midbrain which is located in the anterior aspect and it's being compressed by this uh, by this alum this tumor the meningioma which is which resides in the posterior half of this tentorial hiatus and this posterior notch over here uh, this v-shaped structure is the notch uh, called as a tentorial notch OK, so uh, what what are the uh, topics for discussion today? So these are the ones that we will talk about. We'll look at the circle. Uh, uh, I'm right. Uh, somebody has. Uh, uh, I think I'm getting odd messages on my screen. Uh, so I'm just going to. I apologize for this interruptions. Can you see my screen? Hopefully that should be it. OK, so. Uh, uh, we'll be discussing the sulcal anatomy, the gyral anatomy, which really is uh, the surface anatomy of the brain as we see on the scans, as the surgeons would see during uh, during your operative procedures. Uh, and then we'll use that to define the lobar anatomy. We'll look into the deeper structures, the basal ganglia, the thalami, and then we'll end up the discussion with uh, the white matter tracts and the uh, and and the, and the uh, structures. Just have to interrupt a bit. We can't see your screen at the moment. It's just your camera. Okay. I think what has happened was somebody interrupted. Uh, okay. Uh, can you see it now? Yes, yes. OK, brilliant. OK, thank you. Right, so what we will not be discussing today is uh, these structures because we have got uh, separate uh, sessions for these uh, various structures. Uh, uh, as, as you can see, I won't be discussing the temporal lobe and the limbic uh, system today because it's uh, it's got its own uh, discussion uh, timetable later on. OK, so uh, just a basic concept. What is a gyrus? What is a sulcus? I don't wish to insult your interrupt uh, uh, your intelligence. We know what is a sulcus, which is the depth of the uh, of the script over here in which the CSF resides and the and, and, and the gyrus is the mountain uh, top, if you like. So the CSF itself lies within the crypts. So uh, the CSF, which is the low signal structure here, and you can see it's been highlighted here because of the enhancement. Uh, due to the meningeal disease and here another patient with a flare sequence was a normal CSF uh, within the sulcus should be dark here. It's bright because of the presence of blood. So that's what uh, a sulcus and a gyrus is. Uh, and we are going to use, as I said, the uh, anatomy of the gyra and sulca to uh, look into the details of the anatomy. But before we go into the depths, just some basic concepts of uh, how uh, 
our brain has evolved uh, in terms of vertebrates, which is what we are. And this is just uh, to show you that uh, 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 whilst the humans have got a very complex brain, it all started from a very rudimentary uh, brain structure like in the cod uh, uh, fish over here. And some of those structures still remain persistent. For example, the medulla oblongata is not a lot different uh, uh, to the to the lower vertebrates as compared to to the higher vertebrates. Uh, what has changed is, of course, the structure of the prosencephalon because we have lost a lot of this olfactory apparatus, which is now, uh, as you can see over here uh, from the fish, the olfactory apparatus is very, very strong uh, uh, a component, whilst in humans, uh, it is really a very rudimentary structure and hence our sense of olfaction is very poor as compared to the lower vertebrates. The other thing that has evolved of course is the uh, cerebellum which has progressively uh, got bigger uh, because of the complexity of the tasks that we can perform but also note the occipital pole which initially uh, comprises a very strong component proportionally to the part of the brain here you can see the optic vesicles which are proportionally much larger but as uh, uh, as as the phylogeny advances the occipital poles are really pushed right back to smaller structures explaining why the eagles and the owls have a much better vision than uh, than humans uh, the other thing to, of course, realize is that it has come at a cost uh, and uh, the, the the cost that the lower vertebrates uh, have uh, given is that uh, the prosencephalon is not as well developed as in the humans. And you can see not only the increased size, we have got big heads, I suppose, but also the convolutions, the gyri that have developed, uh, to uh, which would explain why the surface area of the humans is much, much more larger as compared to the lower uh, vertebrates. Uh, so let's uh, let's let's look at uh, the anatomy. Okay, so we said that the sulci is what is going to define uh, the anatomy. So the uh, the the sulci, the two. Uh, important cells we're going to look today are the sylvian fissure or the sylvian sulcus or the lateral sulcus and the central sulcus. So the sylvian sulcus is over here and the central sulcus is uh, over there. Um, and, and, and we'll see what how we define uh, these various uh, various cells. Are. Okay, so the sylvian fissure, it's basically the fissure which separates the temporal lobe over here from the superior more frontal lobe and more posteriorly the parietal lobe. Uh, so that's the sylvian fissure, and that's what we see from the outside, from the surface. This is what a surgeon would see when they were uh, uh, trying to get to the middle cerebral aneurysm in the depth of the sulcus, which does mean that this sylvian fissure also has got a deep component. So if you look at the deep component, which is what we are looking at here on a CT scan and an MR scan over here, the deep uh, aspect of the sylvian fissure is this aspect over here. It separates the frontal lobe from the temporal lobe, and it contains the sylvian artery, the middle cerebral artery. Of course, course, there are veins as well, but uh, we are we are not seeing those veins on this uh, MR angiogram study. Uh, you can see the artery here, which is filled with clot and hence is seen as a, uh, a hyperdense MCA, which is reflected here as a filling defect on the CT angiogram. So this is the deep aspect of the sylvian fissure. OK, so the superficial aspect, which is what we see on a, on a, on on uh, on, on, on our studies, MR studies. Uh, so the uh, sylvian fissure, after it has uh, after it has merged from the deep aspect, then comes more superficially over here, separating the frontal from the temporal lobe. And within the depths of the sylvian fissure, and this is just to show you on the coronal uh, aspects. So the sylvian fissure really runs uh, superficially, but it is still fairly deep, hidden within these two lips, what we call as the opercula, the frontal and the temporal opercula in the depths of which lies this insula and you can see the insula over here and on the surface of the insula lies the deep branch of the middle cerebral artery which is what we are seeing over here and which is what lies within the depths of the sylvan fissure and the sylvan fissure here uh, if you look more closely has got several bits branching off it uh, and uh, uh, what we call as the anterior horizontal ramus anterior vertical ramus and then the posterior big ramus which goes along the length parallel to the superior temporal gyrus which is this here that long length of the posterior stem of the, the sylvan fissure and these are the anterior uh, rami of the of the uh, sylvan fissure and this posterior ramus goes all the way back over here and ends into this uh, structure over here which we look a bit more closely later on which is part of the parietal lobe which is the part of the inferior parietal lobule and we look at this more closely uh, as as uh, as we progress because this gyrus which surrounds the posterior end is called as a supramarginal gyrus which is part of the inferior parietal lobule so that's the 
Sylvian Fisher. So next we come to the central sulcus. Very, very important because we know it separates the motor strip from front from the sensory strip at the back. Uh, and, and, and it sort of starts right at the top near the vertex and goes uh, uh, obliquely down almost towards the sylvian fissure but does not quite intersect it. It stops uh, 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 at the level of this inferior frontal lobule uh, and it's got this sort of sinusoidal, uh, uh, sinusoidal appearance over here and that's uh, uh, that's that's the that's the appearance of it on on this uh, on these pictorial pictures uh, but we are interested in trying to identify this on uh, on scans so a few tips really as to how to identify this central sulcus uh, and this is for some of my uh, colleagues who are very much interested in understanding exactly where the central sulcus is so imagine you're looking from the top if you're looking from the top you have taken off the lid of the brain the cranial uh, vault is off and you're looking down from above so this becomes the midline and this becomes the right hemisphere this becomes the left hemisphere and these are some of the trick uh, uh, some of the uh, tricks uh, you, you will note so the 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 two sulci which are kind of parallel to the interhemisphere fissure is the superior frontal sulcus and this is a section kind of if you believe above the level of the ventricles so this is the superior frontal sulcus which is kind of parallel to this uh, interhemisphere fissure similarly there is a smaller one called as the intraparietal sulcus and the superior frontal sulcus ends over the precentral sulcus and hence the sulcus behind it is a central sulcus. So that's one of the ways of identifying the central sulcus is to try and identify first the superior frontal sulcus and uh, see where it ends and try and identify the sulcus behind. Similarly, the intraparietal sulcus actually reaches the post posterior central sulcus and hence the sulcus in front is the central sulcus. So that's one of the ways and we look at some examples coming uh, in a short while. The next uh, way is to try and look at this appearance of the hook, which is fairly classical, uh, which is seen on the uh, central sulcus, but sometimes can also be seen on the post central sulcus. Uh, uh, next is this appearance, what is called as a bracket sign or a mustache sign, which is produced by the uh, paracentral sulcus with the paracentral lobule and the gyrus which surrounds it is actually the post central gyrus uh, uh, and hence the sulcus in front of that is the central sulcus. So those are some of the uh, uh, tips if you like. So just look at these examples over here. Okay, so this is the superior frontal sulcus and that's what we're looking at the superior frontal sulcus over here and where it joins is the precentral sulcus and hence the sulcus at the back is the central sulcus. So that's one of the ways. This sulcus right at the back is the intraparietal sulcus which is round about here and it joins the post central sulcus and hence the sulcus in front is a central sulcus. So that's the way to identify the central sulcus if you can pick up these longitudinal sulci, sulci at the top. Some other trips, of course, I said we can see the hook sign over here of the central sulcus uh, and, and that sometimes helps. Uh, and the other way is to try and identify this bracket sign or the mustache sign and the gyrus which surrounds it is the, is the uh, uh, paracentral lobule and the sulcus in front is a central sulcus. Uh, and of course, the longest sulcus, which comes almost up to the midline, is supposed to be the central sulcus. So, so these are some of the uh, uh, the tips, if you like, uh, if to try and identify that central sulcus. I know I've spent a few minutes on the central sulcus, but I think it is quite important in trying to localize where the pathology is, especially for a surgeon who wants to operate around this area, and also for a neurologist in trying to determine exactly where the pathology will reside. Uh, uh, based on the patient's clinical symptoms. OK, uh, which brings us to the lower anatomy now. Uh, and and uh, we know all the lobes of the brain. Uh, uh, and and uh, there are the fr just excuse me a minute. Yeah, that's fine. Sorry. So uh, we have got the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, uh, the temporal and the occipital lobe. Uh, we will not be concentrating today on the temporal lobe and the limbic system. It's going to be a separate session by itself. So let's just try and concentrate on some of these other lobes. OK, so the frontal lobe. Uh, uh, starts from the frontal pole, reaches all the way up to the central sulcus, we know, uh, and it's got this uh, three uh, sulci. And and we have looked at some of these, the pre-central sulcus we have seen, which is lies in front of the motor uh, motor strip, and then the superior frontal sulcus, uh, and that's what we saw, which joins the pre-central sulcus. Similarly, there is an inferior central sulcus as well, and that kind of divides the uh, the superior lateral surface of the uh, frontal lobe. And it divides into these various gyri: the superior frontal gyrus, uh, 
which lies above the superior frontal sulcus the middle frontal gyrus which lies in between the two uh, 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 frontal and inferior frontal sulci and the inferior frontal lobule so those are those are the gyri uh, and the inferior frontal lobule which is right at the bottom end actually then has these various structures which uh, we will we'll see in a minute Okay, before we go into the anatomy of, uh, of, of this gyra, it's just important to remind us of this humunculus of how the human representation occurs on this motor and the sensory uh, strip. So this is a coronal representation. This is a sagittal representation. And of course, the leg and the foot lies very much close to the midline. And as we go further away from the midline, the rest of the body unfolds and look at the representation of the thumb, a very large representation. And the inferior frontal lobe is then takes over the function rep functional representation for the face and the tongue uh, and and this is a patient with infarction and you can see oh, probably it is going to affect the shoulder or the arm area of this of this person Okay, so continuing with the uh, uh, superolateral surface of the frontal lobe, we saw the three gyri. Uh, 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 here you have got a superior frontal sulcus, the inferior frontal sulcus, and then that what separates the superior middle and the inferior frontal lobe gyri, which sometimes are. Uh, we can see it on the MR scan if we follow it, especially if you've got a 3D volume scan. So this is a superior frontal sulcus, uh, which would make this as a superior frontal gyrus. This is the middle frontal gyrus, and this is the inferior frontal gyrus or the lobule itself. And this structure over here, this was the Sylvian fissure that we saw in the, uh, in the in the sagittal plane, which is this portion over here, within the depths of which lies the insula, which is this part over here. And the insula is really well covered, well hidden, by these two lips, which are the opercula of the adjacent gyri. Uh, and, and, and we have looked at this now, so we should be able to define what are the various structures over here. So we can see the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the central sulcus, which is uh, this structure here, which comes very close to the midline, the superior frontal sulcus, uh, which would mean that this becomes a uh, superior frontal gyrus, most posteriorly, is the supplementary motor area, which is very, very crucial when we consider epilepsy surgery. So lateral to that will be the middle frontal gyrus and underneath will be the inferior frontal gyrus. So this is just the anatomy of the frontal lobe on the axial scan. And we saw earlier on on the coronal scan what the anatomy lies. Uh, and just to show you some important uh, clinical concepts over here, this is again uh, uh, that superior frontal sulcus that we saw, which is above the level of ventricles, kind of parallel to the midline, uh, uh, which would mean that the uh, that the uh, uh, part of the brain over here is the superior frontal gyrus, and posteriorly, just in front of the prefrontal area lies the supplementary motor area, which is where the abnormality lies in this patient, which uh, which is actually an abscess. And you can see uh, again that superior frontal sulcus over here, which joins the precentral sulcus, uh, and hence this lies within the uh, superior frontal gyrus aspect, which is also here in this particular person, the supplementary motor area. Uh, we mentioned briefly earlier on the Broca's, uh, the inferior frontal lobule, which is beneath the inferior frontal uh, sulcus over here. And this is the Broca's area, which is kind of uh, at the bottom end of the of the inferior frontal lobule uh, surrounding a particular fasciculus called as uncinate fasciculus. And we'll look at this fascicula in a little bit uh, detail uh, more later on. Uh, uh, that was the kind of the superolateral surface of the frontal lobe, and here we are in the midline trying to understand what the anatomy of the frontal lobe is sort of along with the medial aspect. This is just a, a graphic representation, if you like. So you've got the corpus callosum over here. On the surface of the corpus callosum in the midline lies a single edge gyrus. Just on the surface of the single edge gyrus, this black line is a single edge sulcus, which separates it from the rest of the frontal lobe, mainly the superior frontal gyrus as we come back. What we the, the structure on either side of the central sulcus is the paracentral lobule, and this uh, superior uh, and the and and the uh, 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 corpus callosum and the single edge gyrus, which continues beyond it. Uh, above it lies the uh, sulcus, the single edge sulcus, which kind of then turns upwards into the marginal sulcus. Uh, 
Uh, and this is what we are seeing exactly over here. The corpus callosum, the cingulate gyrus with the white matter within it, and this is the cingulate sulcus. And you can see how it turns back into the marginal sulcus on the seen very well on the uh, on the uh, on the MR scan over here. And this patient here actually has a meningioma which is compressing uh, the paracentral lobule, and this is the cingulate sulcus and the marginal gyrus. So you can be sure that this lies within the paracentral lobule aspect of the central sulcus. Uh, so we have looked at the superolateral surface. We have looked at the medial surface. Just look quickly at the inferior aspect of the frontal lobe uh, and uh, the inferior aspect uh, of the frontal lobe is uh, defined by that part which is overlying the orbits. Uh, and that represents the orbital gyra of the frontal lobe. More medially, you have got the gyrus rectus, which lies over the roof of the of the ethmoidal plate. And these small rounded oval structures over here are the olfactory bulbs. And you can see how rudimentary they are. And the olfactory bulbs under uh, over them lies the olfactory sulcus. Uh, which is this is this is this uh, small sulcus defined over here with the gyrus rectus lying medially and rest of the orbital gyri lying laterally over here, and 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 this patient has got trauma to the uh, gyrus rectus as you can see over here with areas of volume loss and gliosis uh, as you can see on the flare sequence. So that's the uh, anatomy of the gyrus rectus uh, and the rest of the uh, floor of the. Uh, uh, anterior cranial fossa or, or is, is mainly covered by these basal frontal gyri, also called as orbital gyri. And, uh, and, and the anatomy can be very, very variable over here. But as a dictum, usually there is an H-shaped uh, uh, sulcus, which is the orbital sulcus over here. And you can see just about here that H-shaped sulcus. And these gyri are then classified as anterior, posterior, medial, and lateral orbitofrontal gyra over here. And then you can understand that this is actually in the posterior aspect of the orbitofrontal gyrus, which is a posterior orbital gyrus over here. And this is in the coronal uh, 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 plane over here. So instead of saying that this lesion lies within the uh, right frontal lobe, you can be more specific and say this lesion actually lies in the posterior orbital gyrus of the right frontal lobe. This happened to be a cysticircus lesion. Uh, moving on to the uh, parietal lobe, uh, which is, of course, the lobe which lies behind the central sulcus. Uh, and it is fairly easy to define it on the sagittal plane uh, uh, anteriorly. But as you go more posteriorly, the limits are a little bit more arbitrary. And these are defined by these various lines, which, of course, you, are, you do not see them on, on a scan. These definitions become a little bit more clearer in the mid-sagittal plane. But it's important, again, to uh, remember the Sylvian fissure, which as it coursed more posteriorly, ended into the supramarginal sulcus over here, which is part of the parietal lobe. So which is here again, the same uh, information shown over here, the inch, uh, the uh, Sylvian fissure, which ends into the inferior parietal lobule over here, part of which is the supramarginal gyrus over here. And this is that inferior parietal, intraparietal sulcus that we saw earlier on, which meets with the post central sulcus which makes this as a superior parietal lobule and this as the inferior parietal lobule. So this is kind of the definition of the parietal lobe, if you like, on the superior lateral surface. Again, to reemphasize, we have looked at the central sulcus, we have looked at the post-central sulcus, and we identified that because of the presence of the intraparietal sulcus on the, C and the MR scan, dividing the parietal lobe into the superior and the inferior parietal lobule. And the inferior parietal lobule has a supramarginal gyrus, which kind of wraps itself around the posterior aspect of the sylvian fissure. And this area is very, very crucial, really, especially within the left hemisphere, because this is what we call as the Wernicke's area. And we'll look at uh, some examples, clinical examples later or around us. And this is again like a surface anatomy picture of this uh, a volume rendered MR image, the sylvian fissure over here uh, coming posteriorly, which is wrapped around by the uh, supramarginal gyrus, which is part of the inferior parietal uh, lobule over here. And this is again that same intraparietal sulcus, which meets the post central sulcus, dividing the parietal lobe into the superior and the inferior parietal lobule. Uh, uh, this is this are some clinical examples over here. This was that intraparietal sulcus we saw, intraparietal sulcus which reached the uh, post central uh, uh, sulcus, and this is a patient with a ganglioglioma, and this is a patient who's actually has infarction over here. Again, look at the anatomy, the sylvian fissure, 
at the posterior end of it is the marginal supramarginal gyrus and this patient actually has an infarction in that and has significant sensory aphasia uh, or vernicase type of an aphasia uh, as opposed to the broca's aphasia which is more predominantly motor uh, aphasia as I said earlier on, the medial surface defines the parietal lobe much more better uh, and the uh, definitions are anteriorly, of course, still remains a central sulcus, but posteriorly is the parieto occipital sulcus or the fissure, which is kind of cons consistently identified as a fairly deep structure sulcus, which runs all the way back up to the cingulate gyrus over here. And that defines the posterior margin of the parietal lobe. And this then becomes the occipital lobe. Uh, the anatomy of the occipital lobe, uh, again, it's uh, very, very variable because we are dependent on this gyri and the cell side to define our anatomy. But the anterior border is very well defined because it is formed by the parieto occipital sulcus. Inferiorly, of course, it rests on the tentorium. So the, all of that is the occipital lobe. It's important to remember that the occipital lobe is like a wedge and the anterior end of the wedge goes as deep almost up to the corpus callosum paralleling uh, the tentorium. Uh, and, 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 and this is what you can see over here. This is the occipital lobe on the axial sequence uh, over here. And, uh, and, and these are the occipital radiations. Uh, more of that a bit later on. These are the occipital radiations which reach up to the occipital poles. Uh, uh, it's important to realize that the occipital pole is actually reaching quite a long way deep inside and the calcarine fissure is actually halfway along that length. So the calcarine fissure, which is a primary uh, cortex for vision, is actually quite deep and not at the occipital pole. So the occipital pole defines more of the secondary and the tertiary areas in terms of vision uh, synchronization. And just to show you, this is a coronal picture uh, going going uh, around about this level over here. And that's the calcarine fissure, which is almost similar to the bracket sign we saw. And this is the calcarine fissure. And here you can see there is an abnormality in the superior lip of the calcarine fissure uh, in, 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 the, in, in this aspect, if you like. And the topographic representation really parallels all the way from the retina through the optic chiasm, through the pulvina, the lateral geniculate body into the occipital lobe. So this patient who has a lesion within the superior aspect of the calcarine fissure is very likely to have inferior quadrantic uh, field defects. Uh, again, this uh, exam, this picture over here to show you the uh, the calcarine fissure. Just see how deep it lies compared to the pole occip uh, occipital pole itself. Uh, and and of course, this is a fairly typical example of occipital lobe infarct. And the uh, the, the slides here is to uh, uh, to tell us that the occipital lobe actually mar uh, lies very close, mar marginating against the tentorium. And this is the tentorial hiatus that we saw earlier on. And what you can see here, we can get a peek through is the part of the cerebellar vermis uh, as we see through the tentorial hiatus. So this is the occipital lobe. Of course, a lot of this, in fact, also involves the posterior aspect of the temporal lobe uh, uh, structures. OK, so that was a bit of the lobe uh, of the anatomy of the lobes. We're going to move on to uh, the next uh, 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 group of neurons, which are the basal ganglia and the thalamus. As we uh, uh, said earlier on, 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 on in our first uh, topic of discussion, that these are should be labeled as the basal nuclei because ganglia actually are neurons which lie outside the nervous system. So really, we should be calling them nuclei. And uh, we do call them uh, as lentiform nucleus, if you like. Uh, and uh, just to looking at their anatomy now uh, of, of, of what we see on, on a, on a MR scan, uh, when we talk of basal ganglia, we mean uh, the caudate nucleus, but we also mean this lentiform nuclei, which are there on either side uh, of the internal capsule. Uh, the basal ganglia, of course, does not include the thalamus, which lies much more medially. So what are the structures within the basal ganglia and what do you mean by corpus triatum? Again, we use them quite loosely sometimes, but corpus triatum by definition is really the caudate nucleus and the putamen. Putamen is the lateral half of the lentiform nucleus. So the caudate nucleus is the structure which lies very close to the uh, frontal horn, while the putamen is the part of the lentiform nucleus which lies much lateral. It's kind of this uh, uh, gray band which lies deep to the uh, insula itself. Uh, medial to the uh, uh, putamen in this red colored area is the 
globus pallidus and the reason why it's shown with uh, red area is because it contains uh, iron and hence on an MR scan it can be seen like here as a dark structure and can be difficult to distinguish it from the posterior limb of the internal capsule which is around about here. So again the basal ganglia we have got a caudate nucleus and the lentiform nucleus the caudate nucleus and the putamen together from the corpus triatum. Some textbook, especially the physiological ones, also include the substantia nigra and the subthalamic nuclei in part. Uh, the globus pallidus and the putamen together along with caudate nucleus will form the basal ganglia and the putamen and the globus pallidus together, they form the lentiform nucleus. And, and, and that's the anatomy uh, that you can see. Uh, and and just to show you some clinical examples again here you have got a caudate nucleus the uh, nucleus which is adjacent to the frontal horn the thalamus which is adjacent to the third ventricle which is compressed with the patient having hematoma over here and this is a patient who has a basal ganglia hematoma which has ruptured into the ventricle uh, uh, as, as you can see over here uh, and just to show you what is a corpus striator structure. So here you have got a caudate and the putamen. This is a patient with extra pontine myelonolysis, and this has affected the corpus striatum, but has spread the uh, spared the thalami over here. Uh, a little bit more into the detail of the caudate nucleus. The caudate nucleus is kind of a C-shaped structure, if you like, uh, which wraps itself around the thalamus. This is the thalamus over here. So the head lies right at the front, and then you get the body, which is round about here, which kind of parallels the ventricles, and then the tail, which kind of swings back and goes to the roof of the temporal horn. Uh, and, and that's a caudate nucleus. And here you have got a patient with an infarction within the caudate nucleus, as you can see on this diffusion weighted image. Uh, the internal capsule itself, what are internal capsule fibers? Basically, these are tracks which either ascend or descend from the cerebral cortex going down towards the basal ganglia, towards the thalami, towards the brainstem and also towards the spinal cord. Uh, and then you have got the uh, anterior limb, the genu and the posterior limb over here of the internal capsule. Just see how the signal of the internal capsule follows very, very closely the signal of the rest of the white matter tracks, whilst the nuclei, which is gray matter, actually follows the signal of the cortex itself. So you have got the anterior limb, the genu, the posterior limb, and a very small part, what is called as a retro lenticular fibers, which then are continuous with the optic uh, radiation over here. So these are the fibers of the internal capsule. This internal capsule uh, separates uh, the uh, the uh, basal ganglia from the from the caudate medially uh, and the thalami, which are which is medially, but it also separates. Uh, 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 but the putamen is located uh, medial to the medial to the internal capsule, and lateral to the putamen is this gray is this uh, white matter called as external capsule, which is here on the coronal plane. Again, here these are the uh, nuclei, the lentiform nuclei. This is the internal capsule which carries information to and fro from the cortex to the brainstem and the cerebellum and the spinal cord. And these are the external capsular fibers. And these external capsular fibers meet up with the internal capsular fibers round about the level of the uh, uh, lateral ventricles. And then these are termed not as internal capsule, not as external capsule, but then these are called as the corona radiator. And above the level of the ventricles, then these get labeled as centrum semiovale. We'll see a bit more of this when we discuss the white matter later on. Uh, uh, the other structure, of course, uh, part uh, of the deep nuclei, it's not part of the basal ganglia, it's the thalamus, which is located on either side of the third ventricle here, just behind the foramen of Monroe, which is this structure over here, which leads the third ventricle into the frontal horns. So that's where the anterior tip of the thalamus resides. More posteriorly, uh, uh, the thalamus uh, expands, uh, and it's more than oval shaped. It has a more triangular configuration with its tip more anteriorly. It's got a medial surface which abuts against the lateral vent uh, third ventricle and then the lateral surface, which is very closely related to the posterior limb of the internal capsule. The thalamus itself has got many nuclei and of course on MR scan, certainly not on our 1.5 or even on three, you can see them, but we can understand the implications, especially when we start seeing pathology. So we should be aware that there are the anterior group of nuclei, there are the posterior group, and there are the lateral group and the inferior group. Uh, we don't see them, but the posterior group, and the largest one of them is the pulvinar. Uh, 
uh, and we know that pul uh, pulmonary is responsible for uh, for for vision. Uh, similarly, posterolaterally is another nucleus, uh, 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 which which is a, which is actually a relay station for our sensory tracts. So here you've got a dorsal and the column system and the spinothalamic system, and these are the sensory tracts which come from the peripheries along the uh, sp uh, spinal nerves, track along the spinal cord into the brainstem, and then decussate and then relay in the thalamus at this level, which is of anteroposterolateral nucleus, before the third order neuron then projects itself on the uh, somatosensory cortex uh, or in the postcentral gyrus. And this is actually an infarction. This patient did present with sensory symptoms in the contralateral side of the body. And here you can be sure that this patient has infarction probably along this spinothalamic or the dorsal column system, which would explain the patient's sensory loss. We talked about a pulvinar, which is actually the largest nucleus of the thalamus, which is present posteriorly. It is responsible uh, for a significant uh, 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 aspect of our uh, visual pathways. It controls the circadian pathway, and you can see it is located uh, uh, just about at the superior inferior aspect of the of the thalamus, and below that lies another smaller nucleus, which is shown over here, is the lateral geniculate body. So the lateral geniculate body is at an inferior level, round about at the level of the superior colliculus, whilst the pulvinar is just at the posterior aspect of the thalamus. So this is the pulvinar. Uh, and uh, can see this patient has involvement of the pulmonar by the CJD disease. And this is a patient who had multiple autoimmune hemorrhages and had developed blindness because of in, uh, uh, hemorrhages within this lateral geniculate body. So the optic nerves, uh, as they pass through the chiasm, will relay in the uh, lateral geniculate body, and then the subsequent third order neurons will go to the visual cortex. So in this person, the lateral geniculate bodies has been affected, explaining their visual loss. Uh, just quickly, really, we hear of these terms uh, uh, epithalamus and subthalamus and hypothalamus. In brief, I will just outline what these are. So we have looked at the thalamus, which is kind of this a big blob in the middle, uh, in the paramedian section on either side. The epithalamus are these posterior recesses of the thalamus, if you like. So this is a high resolution T2 sequence. Uh, you have got a corpus callosum over here. Uh, uh, this is the midline uh, mass intermedia, which communicates to the two thalami, the brainstem over here. So this is the floor of the third ventricle. This is the floor of the third ventricle. Here we have got a roof of the third ventricle. And anteriorly, the floor of the third ventricle leads into this area over here, which we'll look closely when we discuss about the cella tersica and the anatomy of the pituitary gland. Uh, and this area kind of is the hypothalamic area, but this area here posteriorly are the posterior recesses of the third ventricle, which is here. These are the posterior recesses. And this is just a blown up picture over of, of this area over here. These are the posterior recesses, which lie just beneath the splenium of the corpus callosum. Uh, and this is the pineal gland. This is the splenium. And these are the posterior recesses. And these structures here, which kind of suspend the pineal gland to the uh, posterior aspect of the thalamus, the habenular commissure and the posterior commissure, these become part of the epithalamus. Some people also consider pineal gland as part of the epithalamus, but that is a bit controversial. So this is epithalamus. So and the hypothalamus, as we said, was this anterior aspect over here. This is the hypothalamus, uh, uh, which then sends uh, various uh, 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 hormonal contributions to the posterior pituitary over here. Uh, a bit more about this in, in detail when we talk about the pituitary imaging. But the hypothalamus lies anterior to the thalamus along the floor of the third ventricle. Uh, and, and here, this is again to show the hypothalamus. And you can see how this mass lesion has projected itself from the hypothalamic area, a hypothalamic glioma. Uh, uh, and, and this is for my neurological colleagues. You can see this patient has uh, this is the this is in the anterior inferior aspect. This small recess is the anterior inferior recess of the third ventricle, which is around about here. And the thalamus borders the uh, that recess. And this patient has Wernicke's encephalopathy, which of course also affects the medial thalamus. But in this patient has affected the hypothalamus on either side of that inferior recess. We cannot really not mention uh, 
the importance of basal ganglia in our day-to-day uh, -day life uh, in terms of how it uh, uh, it's so relevant for our, our, our movements. Uh, and it's a very complex system of various circuits uh, which operate uh, uh, in parallel with each other uh, uh, and, and they involve the cerebral cortex, they involve the lentiform nuclei, it involves the thalamus, the subthalamic nuclei, the substantia nigra, and hence the importance to mention the upper brainstem as part of this uh, circuit. But it's important to realize that in case if you decide to uh, pick up a glass of water, that information, that process has to start in the prefrontal cortex at the same time, it's going to send you impulses to the striatum. It's going to send impulses to the visual cortex to figure out where that glass is. The spinal cord uh, uh, will send signals from the muscles, uh, from the Golgi bodies to decide for the cerebellum to understand what is the tone in that particular group of muscles which are going to initiate. All of this information is going to be fed back towards the striatum, which is going to be facilitated, excited by certain neurons, which is going to be inhibited by certain neurons. And then the final task, of reaching for that glass uh, and will be facilitated in certain uh, flexor group of muscles. But at the same time, it has to be inhibited into the by, uh, 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 towards the in, uh, extensor muscles to carry out that, that, that simple task. And of course, when these circuits break down, we come into the pathological states of Parkinsonism. Why, why am I talking about this? Because we can actually start seeing some of this nuclei. Uh, and uh, the final bit about the thalamus I wanted to mention was a subthalamic area, which is uh, uh, just to uh, give you the anatomy. This is a coronal, very focused view, high resolution T2 sequence. This is a third ventricle over here with thalami on either side, of course. We are right at the back, so this is the basilar artery uh, uh, with its termination over here. So the midbrain is just about this level over here. So the structure just above the midbrain, you can see, is the substantia nigra, which is uh, in the rostral part of, of the midbrain, and above that is the subthalamic nucleus. And, and it's very, very crucial, really, because uh, it communicates with the globus pallidus. We know globus pallidus is going to lie just medial to the internal capsule over here, which we don't see in this patient, but we know that's where it would lie. It also talks to the substantia nigra, and it will uh, uh, relay information to the thalamus. Uh, and it, of course, it becomes important because even though we are looking in isolation at all these structures, we know that they are interconnected. And uh, when, when uh, uh, when things don't go right, uh, 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 we get the disease manifestations. And this is just to show you whilst planning placement of these uh, 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 pacemakers into the subthalamic regions, we have to be aware of all this anatomy that lies, crucial anatomy that lies behind the normal functioning of uh, of our day-to-day -day motor activity. So for deep brain stimulation, it's very, very essential to know this anatomy, uh, even though you may not see some of these structures, it's important to recognize where these do these structures lie? What is the uh, level where you would expect to find the subthalamic nucleus? What is its relationship to the adjacent substantia nigra? Uh, and, and substantia nigra, just uh, uh, I'm, I know it's part of the uh, brainstem, uh, upper brainstem, but the reason to mention it is because it is such an integral part of the motion activity. It's such an integral part of our basal ganglia. And of course, we see it uh, uh, routinely. You can see this is at the level of the midbrain here. We've got a tentorial hiatus, the occipital lobe at the back. We've got a cerebral aqueduct, and this is the midbrain over here. A lot more about this anatomy we'll talk about tomorrow. And this dark structures around it, these are the red nuclei. And the ones in front are over here, this is part of the substantia nigra. So the substantia nigra is actually all of that area over here. This dark area is what we call as a parse reticular, uh, reticularis. And the slightly less dark area, which is between this dark area and the red nucleus, which is again shown over, over here. This is the parse reticularis. This is the red nucleus. And this lighter area is actually the one which sends the dopaminergic fibers towards the putamen, towards the basal ganglia structures. And this is the output which controls the movements uh, uh, from, from, from the substantia nigra. So this is the parse compacta. And people have actually done measurements to see whether there is a volume loss within this structure uh, and whether we can then predict the severity uh, of, of, of Parkinson's disease. Okay, so we have looked at the various, the two important cell sci. We have looked at the lobar anatomy. Uh, we have looked at the deep nuclei. Uh, in the last 10-15 minutes, we'll look at the white matter uh, itself and the white matter tracks. Uh, 
uh, when we talk of the white matter, you know, we can be uh, descriptive in terms of its location. So yes, the white matter which surrounds the ventricle is the periventricular white matter, uh, which can get affected typically by demyelination, but also by small vessel cerebrovascular disease. And you will have read of our reports talking of periventricular low density changes or high T2 signal changes. As you come up, as I said earlier on, at the level of the roof of the ventricles, this white matter tracks are called as corona radiator. These are the uh, corona radiator and above that, uh, when we come just above the uh, lateral ventricles, these white matter tracts are called as a centrum sumia vale. This patient has got metachromatic leukodystrophy, and this uh, uh, white matter tracts are typical, of, uh, typically affected. You can see kind of the striated appearance of of these white matter tracts. Uh, as you go more peripherally, we come into the subcortical areas, uh, and if you reach out much more peripherally, where the white matter reaches the depths of the gyra, these are the U fibers. These are the U fibers which kind of connect the adjacent gyri to each other and are extremely important so that the adjacent gyri are talking to each other and function and fire synchronously rather than independent of each other. So this is one way of kind of describing the white matter. But the other way, and this is something that we have looked at, at the, during our first uh, discussion when we looked at the organization of the brain and we talked about the commissures, uh, various white matter tracks, and you've got the commissures, you've got the projection fibers, the association fibers, uh, and, 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 and so on. But, uh, but uh, when we talk about the commissures, of course, these are the tracks which kind of connect the two hemispheres and the largest, of course, is a, a corpus callosum. Uh, but we also have these other commissures uh, that, that, are, that are relevant as well, which, which connects the two halves of the cerebral hemispheres. Uh, so the corpus callosum, uh, of course, the biggest commissure of them all, which is uh, connects mainly the frontal and the parietal as well as occipital lobes to each other uh, and you can see it's got this spe specific appearance like a c-shaped structure and it's got uh, the rostrum which is the most anterior inferior aspect then the genu where it starts to bend and then the body which is located in the roof of the lateral ventricles and then it swings back towards the most posterior aspect which is called as a splenium and here you can see the similar uh, arrangement over here of the corpus callosum with a patient having a demyelinating plaque within the within the body of the lateral ventricle, uh, within the body of the corpus callosum. So the corpus callosum, of course, connects most of the frontal, parietal, and the occipital lobes. This is a coronal se sequence, but there is another commissure. So you can see this is these are the lateral ventricles. The third ventricle will lie uh, somewhere uh, in this location. So the corpus callosum actually is a, uh, is a commissure which uh, connects above the level of the lateral ventricles. Whereas there is another commissure which is along the floor, and that is the anterior commissure. And you can see how it connects the temporal lobes. And we can consistently see it on our normal MR scans. And you can see this is the anterior commissure over here, which kind of forms the anterior border of the third ventricle, if you like. So this is this is the anterior commissure. And you can see how it extends on both sides towards the temporal lobes, allowing freedom of exchange of movements between these uh, uh, two two uh, uh, halves of the of the brain. Uh, we have looked at this slide be uh, before. We have talked about the habenular commissure and the posterior commissure. The functions of these are uh, not clearly defined, but probably relate to synchronous functioning of the upper midbrain uh, uh, on 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 both sides. Uh, what do you so these were the commissions. What are the projections fibers? Uh, we have talked about this in the past. We have said that the projection fibers are the ones which project out from where they start. Uh, so uh, and there are many of them. So the typical one, of course, are the corticospinal tracts. Similarly, we'll have the corticobulbar tracts, the cortico cerebellopontine tracts. So they kind of start at one area and they project downwards. These are oriented in a vertical fashion uh, and, and, and they can terminate either at the level of the brainstem, we call them the corticonuclear, or they can go into the cerebellum. So they are the corticopontocerebellar tracts. Remember the cerebellum needs to know what the brain is thinking. So if your prefrontal cortex has decided to lift up the pen to write something, Information has to go to cerebellum even before we start picking up because the cerebellum has to know what is the exact tone within your fingers, what is the exact position of the fingers before the motor fibers can then direct them to uh, pick up the pen and, pen and start writing. So these are all the projection fibers. Uh, 
and that the, the stereotypic example, of course, are the corticospinal tracts. And this is a patient with uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. And you can see there is loss of myelin within that white matter tract. This is another patient, and they have had an infunction within the corona radiata. Remember, we said corona radiata are the white matter tracts uh, at the level uh, of the of the roof of the lateral ventricles over here. And you can see they have then subsequently degenerated the rest of the pyramidal tracts. And this is nothing but Wallerian degeneration of the white matter tracts below the level of infarction. So these are just to show you what are projection fibers. Uh, and, 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 and we can use this to uh, perform a uh, uh, tractography where you can actually map out this uh, tracks. We can map out uh, where exactly the uh, uh, motor strip is, which is a premotor cortex, which is a supplementary motor area, so on and so forth. And the fibers, the crossover, and the displacements can be characterized. And these are very useful, uh, especially when you are uh, when we are evaluating for uh, tumors around around uh, that area to see whether they are displaced, which way they are displaced, or in fact, whether tumors is involving those tracks. Uh, and, and, and of course, there are lots of many tracks. We don't see these tracks on an on a MR scan. If you look at this MR scan, uh, we don't we cannot really pinpoint and say where they are. But of course, they exist. We know they exist. And these are specific bands. Uh, so when I said that the occipital lobe has seen the pen, it has to send information to the frontal lobe. And these are the front occipital tracks or the superior longitudinal fasciculus. Similarly, you'll have the temporal occipital tracks, the inferior fasciculus. Uh, we saw a patient with Wernicke's aphasia, and this is part of the arcuate fasciculus right at the back over here. Similarly, there is a uh, uncinate fasciculus which connects the temporal lobe with the frontal lobe over here. So all these fasciculi are nothing but bands of white matter which connects various parts of the brain. And this over here is the typical area where the uncinate fasciculus is, which kind of surrounds, if you like, the proximal aspect of the sylvian fissure. We know that within the depths of this fissure lies the middle cerebral artery. And this white matter tract, which kind of wraps itself around above the sylvian fissure, is nothing but the uncinate fasciculus. So if you see this area, the next report that we should say is not that the tumor involves the frontal temporal area, but we should say, yes, it involves the inferior aspect of the frontal lobule, the superior aspect of the temporal lobule, and it is likely to involve the uncinate fasciculus. We can be a bit more uh, informative towards the clinicians so that they understand the implications of treating lesions around that area. Uh, we saw an example of of uh, of Wernicke's aphasia. This is uh, this is uh, this is again the. Uh, 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 to 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 demonstrate what the arcuate fasciculus uh, is. This was the sylvian fissure. We said that behind the sylvian fissure lies the supramarginal sulcus and the angular sulcus. And these are the white matter tracts which connect the anterior aspect of the uh, uh, inferior frontal lobule from the Broca's area towards the towards the Wernicke's area. So this is the arcuate fasciculus. And some of these fasciculi you can map out on 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 uh, functional imaging by asking the patient to carry out that specific task. Uh, another uh, fasciculus, which we don't call as fasciculus, but but of course it is a fasciculus because it is a band of white matter, is the optic radiation, uh, and which which kind of starts from the level of the uh, lateral geniculate body, uh, and that's where the third order neuron will start wrap itself around the lateral ventricle and reach the optic. Uh, uh, the occipital lobes over here. And again, it's uh, important to know uh, the, the full length of this because you can have pathology which can affect anywhere along the length and cause visual problems. We saw earlier on the patient with lateral geniculate body involvement, and here you can have uh, 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 diseases along the walls of the uh, of the uh, of the uh, uh, ventricles. And again, it's important to realize that the optic radiation can actually swing a little bit more laterally into the temporal lobes. Uh, and these are called as a Myers loop when they go a bit more anteriorly than usual. And it's again important because some of the functional surgeries targeting the uh, hippocampi, the diseased hippocampi for temporal lobe epilepsy may accidentally damage the Myers uh, loop uh, which is part of the optic radiation and can cause visual uh, visual uh, deficiency. And this is just to show you patient who came with occipital visual seizures uh, and this is involvement of the uh, of the uh, of the optic radiation which parallels uh, the ventricles before it reaches towards the occipital lobe. 
Okay, uh, I think I think that is what I wanted to share with you. Uh, so it's important what that we make ourselves comfortable with what the cells I look like. It's important we looked at the central sulcus. We have looked at the sylvian fissure, the anatomy. We have used that to define the anatomy of the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, and also the occipital lobe. But I think it's important to know that this anatomy can be very variable because the cell size, even though they have got a particular pattern in a given individual, they can be very, very variable. And this is where it's so important to understand that the functional anatomy, if you know the function of the area, it will help us to understand what the structural anatomy of, uh, of, that, of that area is. And this is where the physiology and the function of that area will really help us to underpin what the anatomy of that particular gyrus or the tract or those particular group of nuclei are. So, so I think we will stop there. Uh, uh, tomorrow, as, uh, as we know, we are going to discuss the infratentorial region in, in detail. But this was kind of a brief overview of uh, the anatomy of the supratentorial structure. So we'll, we'll, we'll stop there. I'm happy to take any questions, any comments. So tomorrow we will uh, talk about the infratentorial system. So mainly we'll be discussing about the brainstem and the cerebellum. Uh, we will have a different discussion on the nerves themselves. Though we will look at the cranial nerve nuclei, we won't be looking at the nerves as they exit out of the brainstem. Uh, and of course, the skull base uh, will be dealt will be dealt separately in, uh, in in different topics. So tomorrow will be on the brainstem and the cerebellum. Thanks, Dr. Hawadka. That was great. OK. OK, so if there are no sessions, uh, I will let you get on and uh, enjoy the rest of your uh, Saturday. OK, thank you.